All right, so if you're watching this video, you understand the basics of SPI, and you're ready to get started implementing a spy master in Verilog for your particular FPGA. Now, the code that I'm going to talk through is actually available on GitHub. If you go to github.com forward slash nanland forward slash SPI dash master, you can uh, access this code and look at it there and follow along. Go to the, this VHDL and Verilog. Now, we're going to be talking through spymaster.v. So that's, what, that's the code that I have right here. Uh, we'll talk through this briefly, just go through kind of how this SPI master is implemented, how I chose to implement it. And then I will run a test bench and show you that it's working correctly. Now, this is the first thing to say is this is the SPI master with uh, no chip select on this particular, uh, this particular implementation of the SPI master. I actually wrote the spy master at a low level and then put a wrapper around it to add the chip select functionality. And the reason I did that was because um, you might have a reason to use a spy master that doesn't use chip select. So if, if that's the case, you can just use the, the low level spy master. If you do need chip select functionality, you can use the whole with chip select thing, which will instantiate the spy master for you. So I'll talk through that low level module first, which is just the spy master with no chip select. That's what I have in, uh, in front of me here. Uh, so this is responsible for creating a spy master for you. Here's the interface. Um, there are two parameters that specify how this operates. The first, the first one is spy mode, so 0, 1, 2, 3, and you can check Wikipedia to see what those correlate to, and I also put it in the description uh, for what those mean. And then the second one is clocks per half bit, and what that's doing is it's saying, given your eye clock frequency, how many uh, clocks are there in a half bit of your SPI clock. So for example, um, let's say you have a 100 megahertz master clock and you want to generate a 25 megahertz SPI clock. Well, there's, uh, there's 100 divided by 25 is four clocks per, the relationship is four clocks to go from the fast to the slow and half of uh, a half cycle is two. So it's four divided by two. Um, so that's, that's how you can generate any arbitrary SPI clock frequency. Um, you must be at least greater, must be greater than or equal to two uh, clocks per half bit on that particular parameter for this to work correctly. For the MOSI signals for transmitting stuff out of your SPI master, you have um, two signals that kick off a transaction. So ITX byte is the byte that you want to send out of your SPI master, and then ITX data valid is a single clock cycle wide pulse that you just boop pulse your data valid. It's a single bit wide, and that'll tell the SPI master to look at the data that's on TX byte and ship it out over the SPI interface. Um, you can only do this, or at least the SPI master will only respond to this when OTX ready is high. So that's an output from this spy master that tells your code, the higher level code, I'm ready to accept another byte. Go ahead and give me something. So you give it a new byte, it'll it'll convert that byte from a parallel byte to a serial byte and ship it out one bit at a time uh, out the SPI master interface. The master is also responsible for receiving data from the slave on the MISO interface. So that is um, any any data that comes in through oh uh, sorry I spy MISO here uh, will get serialized. Uh, it'll get converted to parallel data, and then the received data will appear on this ORX byte which is a byte that was received on the MISO line, and ORX data valid um, DV. It's a one clock cycle wide pulse that'll just boop and say, go ahead and look at the value on OR ORX byte because it's valid now. So for every data you send out on the TX interface, you get something back on the RX interface. All right, there's some definition of some signals and registers and wires up top here, and then we get into some of the code. So um, assigning W underscore C Paul clock polarity. This is used to uh, drive these always blocks down below, and it's just used to allow working uh, with the different SPI modes. Uh, C Fa, which is your clock phase, again, similar functionality where if your clock phase is on the leading or trailing edge of the data, uh, those, those signals will allow for flexibility to work in all four modes of SPI. All right, here's some of the meat. So uh, the 
this pur the purpose of this particular always block is to generate the spy clock the correct number of times. So this is all all this is doing is generating uh, the clock. So um, it's using your input clock to do it, and it's just counting edges basically of your input clock uh, to generate uh, your spy clock. So your spy clock is counting up some, to some number, and when it gets to that, this is but this is your um, input parameter, the clocks per half bit, and when it gets to that number, it'll toggle the clock. So if it's at the beginning, it'll set it to zero, and then it's, when it's halfway there, it'll do our spy clock gets not our spy clock. So this is where the inversion happens. And then later on in the code down here, I um, actually output the, the internal art register spy clock to the output spy clock. Um, and I just make sure that they're, they're aligned correctly. So that's the purpose of this process here, just to generate the spy clock. Um, this next process uh, registers the input uh, ITX byte when the data valid is pulsed. So all this is doing is looking for when that ITX data valid uh, is pulsed. And when it is, it'll register the input ITX byte, which is the input that you specify at the higher level, to an internal RTX byte, which is a 8-bit internal register. So I, I do this often. I think it's a good practice. Um, whenever you have an external signal, uh, and a data valid pulse and some data along with it. If you want that data along with it to like stay stable, but you can't guarantee that you don't want to necessarily in guarantee that the higher level module is going to keep that byte stable for the entire time. You should always register signals at a low level. It, it uses a couple flip flops, but nowadays FPGAs are big enough that it's it, you don't need to count flip flops. Don't waste your time. Um, it's definitely better to just do the safe thing and register that in that internally that that byte so that if that byte changes at the higher level module the internal module can still work fine uh, because this does get serialized this this rtx byte will be serialized shipped one bit at a time out of your spy master interface which is right here so this is the next the next uh, yeah the next always block down here we'll basically take that internal rtx byte and just ship it out one one bit at a time so it counts it's got to count uh, from msb first <coughs> that's the definition of, of how spy works um, so this bit count just keeps track of which bit you're on of your byte so um, you can do this similar to like how you might index into an array in c um, you can index into a register using some some integer or some register count so this rtx bit count is a three bit counter Zero to, seven, 0 to 7, so that gives you 8 values total, and that's how you index into your byte. So you're, you're driving O spy mosey directly from that internal register that you've created, given some bit counter. So you keep track of your bit counting uh, here. And the way this works is it's flexible enough to use um, all spy modes. So it's if, if it's a leading edge and CIFA is set, or if it's a trailing edge and not CIFA is set, this is just to work in different spy configurations. Um, and it'll count down from 7. So 76543210, MSB first. Most significant bit first. That's your transmit side. Pretty good. All right. On the receive side, on the meso side, you need to be doing this in parallel because as you're shipping out data, you're also receiving data from your slave. And uh, that's the purpose of this project here. Oh, sorry, this process here. Always block. We're in Verilog. Always block. So the purpose is to read in MISO data. Uh, so if your transmitter is ready, meaning nothing is currently active on the line, then you can go ahead and reset things to some default state. Your, re your RX bit counter goes to seven, so you receive MSB first, you transmit MSB first, same, same thing. And then similarly here, um, depending on what mode you're operating in, if it's leading edge and not CFA or trailing edge and CFA, um, again, this is just to work in multiple SPI modes. Um, you basically just wait until that leading edge comes along. When the leading edge comes along or the trailing edge comes along, depending on your mode, you go ahead and open up your eye, look at the data that's on SPI, Bose, SPI MISO, and that is guaranteed to be right in the middle of the transition. So the data has been stable for the longest, so you know that you can sample it internally. So even if you're, you're sampling at uh, a different clock rate than your SPI is running at, but since you know that the data has been stable for a long time, that's okay. 
um, you're not going to have any metastability issues by sampling in the middle of the data. Metastability is bad. Uh -huh. So you're basically doing the opposite on the receive side. You're building up your Rx byte with some bit, some bit counter uh, as you're indexing to your array, essentially. Um, and ORx byte is eventually what's going to be sent up to the higher level module. And data valid gets pulsed when your bit count is equal to three. I'm uh, sorry, zero. Uh, when your bit count is equal to zero, that's your LSB has been received. You pulse the data valid a single clock cycle, um, and that tells the higher level module go ahead and check out what's on the RX byte signal because everything's ready to ready. To, the byte's been received and you're ready to you're done. Um, this is a kind of a good trick uh, that I like to do sometimes is um, you can set a default assignment earlier in an always block like I did here. And then later on, if you ever change that default assignment to something else, it'll take that new value. So, but by default, every time, if it doesn't hit this particular if statement or if condition, it won't use this, um, it'll just use the default. So for example, here, I, I assign ORx data valid to zero. It's basically, it's always zero all the time, unless there's this one clock cycle in which it gets pulsed to one, and then I want it to be a one. Uh, kind of handy, rather than trying to figure out all the else, trying to like else it out, is, can sometimes be tricky to, to capture all the data valids where it's not one. And then, and then we're back down to the bottom here where uh, your spy clock is just being uh, delayed by one clock cycle just for alignment purposes. So that's it for the spy master and Verilog for the RTL code. In the next video, I'm going to be simulating this and uh, creating a simple test bench and looking at some waveforms to make sure that this is working correctly. Hey, I just wanted to jump in at the end of this video real quick to say, please check out patreon.com forward slash Nandland and consider supporting me there. I would really appreciate it. It helps me cranking out these good tutorials and these videos. So if you found this valuable, uh, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting me. Keep me making good content. Uh, in addition to that, please consider getting yourself a Go board so you can actually program this code and try it out on real hardware. They're available at nanland.com. And thanks for your support.